At Christmas time, Christians like me, despite the chaos of the shopping, the eating, the drinking, should really be celebrating the birth of Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin, the Saviour child sent to earth to save us all. The story we have been told for over 2,000 years that is supposed to be exclusive to Christianity. But what if I were to tell you that the story of Jesus wasn't quite as unique as you might have thought? That the Hindu god Krishna also had a miraculous birth and was also attended by angels and shepherds? This is the story of the child Krishna. But it could well be the story of Jesus. And that like Jesus, the Buddha also performed miracles, walking on water and feeding the 500. So, in some ways, I'm not just following Jesus, I'm also following Buddha. And that some are convinced that Jesus didn't die on the cross in Jerusalem, but is buried in India. So, this suggests that the tomb is the tomb of Jesus. This is where Jesus is buried. And that there are others who believe Jesus had a very different life story and even see him as a symbol of oppression. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. Then there are the Muslims who believe Jesus will come back at the end of time and who even have a tomb awaiting him next to Mohammed's in Medina. And there is also an ancient Christian text that has lain hidden for over 1,600 years that has a very different version of Jesus' story. If there are so many different stories like Jesus's, which one is the real deal? I'm going to do what most Christians fear to do, go outside the Christian tradition on a journey from Jesus' traditional birthplace in Bethlehem to the foothills of the Himalayas, from ancient Egypt to modern-day India, to find out about these stories, investigate their origins, and uncover who Jesus really was. I began my search for the hidden Jesus in Vrindaban, one of India's holiest cities, and the center of worship for the ancient Hindu god Krishna. It's the month of Kartik, one of the most auspicious times of the Hindu year, when millions of pilgrims come here to worship Krishna. In ancient Hinduism, Krishna is seen as the supreme god who descends to earth to fight evil. The stories concerning his life go back 800 years before the birth of Jesus. I am here to explore the similarities between Jesus Christ and Krishna, and in particular, their birth stories. Srivatsa Goswami is a Brahmin priest who can trace his lineage back to the founders of this holy city more than 600 years ago. I tell you a story. The story of a wondrous birth where the child is born in the humblest settings the Mother Earth can provide. Every year, just like our nativity plays about the birth of Jesus, Hindus perform Ras Leelas, or religious passion plays about the birth of Krishna. In the story, there is an evil king who tries to prevent the coming of the child. In a prophecy, the evil king is told that a child will grow up to kill him. So he goes on a killing spree, murdering babies. It was beginning to sound familiar. In the story, the stars portends the birth. The crucial hour is the middle of the night. There is also an immaculate conception, and the birth is heralded by angels. While the evil king's guards sleep, the father is told to flee with his family. They have to cross a river, but the waters are miraculously parted. You might wonder, whose birth story is this? This is the story of 
the child Krishna. Not Jesus, Krishna. But it could well be the story of Jesus. The tyrant could be Herod. And then the details go on, you know. And as Jesus is heralded by John the Baptist, so Krishna is heralded by his elder brother Balram. In the same story, you know. So, 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 I mean, how, how, I mean, same story. I mean, this is absolutely amazing stuff because most Christians, yes. when they see the nativity every Christmas, uh, December, yes. they think this is unique. When I was a child at Sunday school, I was taught very little about other religions. Instead, I was told repeatedly that the Christian story of Jesus was totally unique and that there was only one way to salvation through him. Anything else was entertaining evil. Who's in this, uh, this shrine here? It is, it is also Lord Krishna when he become young. So that's Radha. Krishna as a young person yes. with his, his love. His, his Miss love. Radha. Miss, oh, right. To celebrate what Krishna's birthday, just like we do at Christmas, Hindus also Jiva. build nativity Jiva. cribs. When I see images of the baby Jesus, often at yes. Christmas, yes. both of the cultures have scenes or images of their deity as a baby. Yeah. So in Christianity you have Jesus in the crib and he have Krishna in a swing yeah. with his mother pulling the swing. Yes. The more I looked at it, the more similarities I found between Krishna and Jesus. You have a flute? And the more I realized that Jesus's story may not be unique. Ah, oh, that's it, that's Krishna. Have you sold them always to Hindus or have Christians bought them? Have Muslims bought them? Hindus buy them, Muslims buy them. What about Jesus? Does he think Jesus is the same as Krishna? Yes, they are the same. He is also an incarnation of God. Christians go on pilgrimages to places connected with the life story of Jesus, Hindus are encouraged to visit the holy sites connected with Lord Krishna and his many miracles. One of the holiest is Radhakund, where Hindus come to take ritual baths. I caught up with a group of Hare Krishna devotees, led by Dibandu Das. There are lots of similarities between the life of Jesus and the life of Krishna. Did you think they were similar in, in other ways? In part of India, the dialect, they say Krishna, Krista. Krista. And we know the Greek is Christos. So they're coming from the same root, actually. So not only are the birth stories of Krishna and Jesus very similar, in at least one Indian dialect, it seems that even their names sound the same. As Krishna says, every living being is my son, so in one sense we're all sons of God. Jesus was an obedient son, so therefore he said he's called the only son of God, because we're here because we're sinful. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's no question of sin for Jesus. He was, a, he was pure from his birth. Krishna is, loves us more than we, we can ever know, so he tries in different ways by sending different messengers, different gurus, any way, anyhow. He comes himself in various incarnations, just in so many different ways, according to time and culture, he tries to bring us back. I was taught that throughout the Gospels, Jesus told his disciples to forsake all and follow me. Now I find it's just the same with the followers of Krishna. They also believe that by chanting Krishna's name over and over again, they will get closer to him. When I recite Christianity's most famous prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, the very second line is, Hallowed be thy name. It's almost exactly the same idea. As a Christian, I've been surprised at the many similarities I've found between Krishna and Jesus. But most Christian fundamentalists 
still refuse to accept that they can learn anything from or have anything in common with any other religion. I, like many Christians in the West, mm. went to Sunday school, mm. went to church, mm. and was frankly taught to be intolerant towards other religions. And when we were taught about Hinduism and the many gods, we were actually taught to see these gods as idols. And Krishna, rather than being a manifestation of the divine, mm. was an idol. A fourth century poet, uh, talking to God, whoever the God is, the Guru or the God, he says uh, there are innumerable ways to reach you. As all the rivers, straight or crooked, meet the ocean. So, oh my Lord, all these various ways uh, somehow take us there. So if you have that spiritual humility, to not denounce the other roads out of existence, other ways of out of existence, and cling to your own road, you will reach there. If we could learn to find unity in these common spiritual values, things that aren't unique to Jesus, then it would make things like Christian fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, even Hindu fundamentalism that attempts to separate people, sure. it would make it even more of a nonsense than it actually is. One of the opening prayers of Rig Veda, it says, Ano bhadraha kritvo yantu vishwataha. Let noble ideas and thoughts come to me from all over the world. Mm. Unless we keep our doors open, mm. the humanity is going to be poorer and poorer. Yeah. But the factors which are responsible for that are political and economic factors. Yeah, yeah. If we don't have the logic of love as a driving force behind politics and economy, mm. the future of religion is very bleak, it's bleak it's very bleak. bleak. At a key moment in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples, other sheep have I which are not of this fold. I believe he was telling them and us that there are other ways to God just as valid as Christianity. And from what I've seen here in India, there are lots of points of connection between Hinduism and Christianity, between Jesus and Krishna. And Hindus have no problem understanding Jesus and accepting his teachings. My last night in Vrindaban was the culmination of the Hindu holiday of Diwali, or the Festival of Light. Traditionally, everyone lights lamps or candles to signify the victory of light over darkness, good over evil. Hindus believe that there is something inside all of us which is pure, infinite and eternal. So just as Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas, Hindus have Diwali, a celebration of this inner light, the knowing of which will banish all darkness, all ignorance. But what worries me is that many Christians still have a big problem with Hinduism and think that worshipping Krishna is plain wrong. For me, this is not the right attitude. The real Jesus didn't just want people to become Christians, but for everyone to experience the kingdom of God by whatever means is best for them. In the next part, I will investigate another major religious teacher whose religion has spread all over Asia. Not only does his life story have uncanny similarities to that of Jesus, but his teachings are very similar too.
already heard of the remarkable similarities between the life stories of Krishna and of Jesus. But here in India, there's another important religious figure, also the result of miraculous birth, who was tempted by the devil before beginning his public ministry at the age of 30, who performed miracles such as walking on water and the feeding of 500, and who challenged the established religious order and presented an alternative way of understanding the world, and who spread his teachings and wisdom through parables and sayings. Now, it all sounds extraordinarily familiar, but I'm not talking about Jesus, but of Prince Sudhartha Gautama, or Buddha. I am now in northern India, in the foothills of the Himalayas. After the Chinese invasion of Tibet in 1950, this area became the spiritual home of Tibetan Buddhism. In my search for the hidden story of Jesus, I have come here to investigate the similarities between Jesus and Buddha. More than 400 years before Jesus appeared in Palestine, Prince Siddhartha Gautama was born the only son of a local king. According to tradition, his mother, Maya, gave birth to him miraculously. Like Jesus, he was also predicted to become a great man from birth and wise men traveled to see him. As Siddhartha neared his 30th birthday, he began to realize the world was full of pain and suffering. So he decided to leave home and take up the life of a wandering monk. For the next six years, he meditated on the sufferings of the world. Like Jesus, he was also tempted by a devil figure, but resisted. Finally, one day, while sitting under a tree, he found enlightenment and began his ministry to teach the world about Dharma, or the right way of living. Today, Buddhism has spread all over the world and has over 300 million followers. I had arranged to meet Thai Situ Rinpoche, the 12th reincarnation of a Buddhist Lama or spiritual master, who can trace his lineage back to one of Prince Siddhartha's original disciples. Buddha, as we know, was born miraculously, and we know that he, like Jesus, uh, was tempted by the devil. Uh, we know that he performed miracles, um, and there are some miracles which are very similar to the miracles of Jesus, um, walking on water. We know that Jesus' life, he challenges the religious order, and so does Buddha. So, I mean, how do you understand the similarities that there are in their lives, just in the lives and the way that they're mapped out? Well, uh, uh, I... This is interesting because uh, on earth you cannot find one person who don't like to be happy and who like to suffer. You cannot find one. Everybody like to be happy. Everybody don't want to suffer. So the teaching of Buddha is based on that. The teaching of Christ is based on that. And uh, why? I think is because both of them are humans. Right. right. But the uh, good thing is uh, if you are following uh, pure uh, Christian uh, lineage, and then uh, uh, you are uh, uh, following the path already. In the New Testament, in John's Gospel, Jesus taught that I am the way, the truth and the life, and that by following him you can enter the kingdom of God. Buddha taught that if you follow his path and lead a moral life, are mindful of your thoughts and actions, and develop wisdom and compassion, you could reach enlightenment too. In their teachings, both Jesus and Buddha provide a very practical guide to personal transformation that is remarkably similar. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Consider others as yourself. Professor Duncan Durrett has been studying Buddhism for the past 50 years. Any Buddhist hearing the Sermon on the Mount 
would immediately say to himself, here is the teaching of our Buddha, for sure. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other also. If anyone should give you a blow with his hand, with a stick or with a knife, you should abandon any desires and utter no evil words. The Buddha and Jesus were attempting to achieve the same object, that an individual could be shown how to be righteous. Righteousness is a technical term amongst the Jews and amongst Christians. A righteous person will always look out for his duty to his neighbor. And the Buddha, on the other hand, is looking for what was called dharma, and that can also be translated righteousness. He wanted the individual to have a model, uh, somebody who has got rid of anything which stands in the way of his being a perfect man. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. From anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Hatreds do not ever cease in this world by hating, but by love. This is an eternal truth. Overcome anger by love. Overcome evil by good. Overcome the miser by giving. Overcome the liar by truth. The Buddhists think that there is a continuum of life, and by perfecting oneself, one reaches a stage where one is not reborn and suffers no more. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven which exists on the earth amongst those who are real subjects of the real king that is God himself. These teachings are very similar and the Buddhist would understand the, the Christian and vice versa. There's so much similarity even in that aspect in Buddhism and Christianity because I spent times in monasteries and they use incense, mm. and they use uh, rosary, and also they use the folding the hand during the prayer. And also we have uh, a double doji, the cross of the Vajra, and you have a cross. Uh, so these are uh, a lot of similarities are there. When you are following a path with one motivation to make everything better, make everyone free from suffering, then regardless of how long it will take, we are all going into the same direction. Do you yeah, understand? I understand. Yeah. I understand. So, as a Christian, when I look at the teachings of Buddha yes. and see the similarities, yes. in some ways, yes. I'm not just following Jesus, yes. I'm also following Buddha. Uh, well, uh, uh, I can respect that, I can respect that, but I cannot speak for you. Mm. You, 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 have, you, have, you have spoken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Tibetan Buddhism, there is a type of holy figure known as a bodhisattva, someone who has put on full enlightenment so they can help others along the right path here on earth. Many Buddhists think Jesus was a bodhisattva. Before I left northern India, I wanted to meet one of Tibetan Buddhism's holiest leaders, the Gyama Kamapa, or the one who carries out the teachings of Buddha, the 17th reincarnation in a line stretching back over 800 years. I was granted a private audience. How would you explain Jesus as a Buddhist? Where would you place him? Jesus was undoubtedly a great holy being for the world. And from a Buddhist perspective, we can definitely recognize him as a holy being. When someone abandons his own self-interest for the benefit of others, we can call him a bodhisattva. Although Jesus wasn't a Buddhist, we can still call him a bodhisattva. One of the things that amazes me about the story of Jesus mm -hmm. and the story of Buddha mm -hmm. is the similarities in their teachings. Mm -hmm. 
Their thoughts or teachings are similar because their motivation is to guide others towards the right path. If we look back into history, the stories of these holy beings are always similar. During Buddha Sakyamuni's time, the caste system was extremely prevalent. He worked very hard to undo the caste system and bring equality to all. For example, there were as many nuns as there were monks. Jesus also brought about many similar changes, such as equality and justice. They both understood their society's problems and so challenged those dogmas. So what could be the cause of these similarities? At the time that the Bible was being written, we know that trade routes existed between India and Palestine via the Silk Road in the north and the sea in the south. And there are even Western historical accounts of travelers, diplomats and monks journeying from India to the Middle East. According to Indian sources, the Emperor Ashoka, who ruled most of India 250 years before Jesus was born, sent Buddhist missionaries all over Asia, and some may even have made it to Greece and Egypt. So there is a possibility that Buddhists and early Christians could have met and exchanged ideas. In the course of this missionary endeavor, Buddhists will have found their way to all the major centers of learning. And so lives of, of Buddha will have found their way to Alexandria, we can be sure of it. They were engaging in a common search for truth not only to find the truth, but how individuals might achieve it, whatever their backgrounds. So you may say there was a two-way exchange. Yes, it is very possible. We have stories where sailors and soldiers who went on campaigns took Buddhist teachings with them. Some believe, and I have been informed, how during Jesus' lost years, he came to India at the peak of Buddhism. He was impressed by the teaching and took it back with him. So yes, it is very possible. And as Buddhism developed, the uh, representatives of the Buddha said that there are Buddhas in other lands. And when the story of Jesus is told and how he knowingly and deliberately flung his life away to show the result of his teaching, there we are, there's a Buddha. Whether Buddhists and Christians did meet or not, the similarities between the teachings of Jesus and Buddha are remarkable. But many Christians still find it easy to reject this as they are thousands of miles and hundreds of years away from each other. In the next part, I will investigate two pagan gods, much closer to home and much harder to dismiss.
One of London's most famous landmarks, St. Paul's Cathedral, is dedicated to Christianity's first theologian and, after Jesus himself, arguably its true founder, the Apostle Paul. It was Paul who first took Christianity out of its Jewish-Palestinian setting and transformed it into a world-beater. It was Paul and his followers who created much of the Christianity we know today. A religion of salvation by faith in Jesus, a pre-existent divine being sent to earth by God to save us all from our sins. Much of the dogma that surrounds Jesus was created by Paul. Paul describes himself as the apostle to the Gentiles, or as we'd know them today, pagans. Paul was supremely practical in terms of converting non-believers. And he even admits in his letter to the Corinthians, I have become all things to all people that I might win them to Christ. And what he meant by that was that he was willing to adapt and adjust himself to whatever circumstances he found himself. And if that meant a little bit of borrowing from pagan religion, then so be it. My search for the hidden Jesus has now brought me to the north of England, to the border of the Roman Empire, Hadrian's Wall. When Jesus first appeared 2,000 years ago, he was born into a world full of pagan gods. And if he was to survive, he would need to compete on their terms. And this could mean reworking some of the best ideas that had already existed for thousands of years. Just after the Second World War, there was an incredible series of archaeological discoveries in the UK. They revealed a network of Roman temples from London in the south to Hadrian's Wall in the north. They were dedicated to a pagan religion that existed at the same time as Christianity and to a god who had striking similarities to Jesus, Mithras. Lindsay Allison Jones is the director of the Museum of Antiquities at the University of Newcastle and an expert in the mystery cult of Mithras. Oh, wow, this looks really well preserved. It is, isn't it? Yes. Now, what could I have expected to see if it was uh, in its original condition? You probably wouldn't have seen very much at all because it was sunk right down. The worshippers of Mithras um, were trying to reconstruct, um, in a sense, the original cave of Mithras. So they wanted it dark, they wanted it subterranean. This would have been doorway. You would have gone in through here. You would then come in through here into the actual temple itself. Um, and you'd see in front of you the three altars there. And behind that, there would be a large relief showing Mithras killing the primeval bull. That was the act of creation for the worshippers of Mithras. May he bring us help. May he bring us comfort. May he bring us joy. He, the awful and overpowering, worthy of sacrifice and prayer. Mithra, the lord of wide pastures. And Mithras is a god to the good side, I presume, the, Myth, the light. Yes, Mithras was the lord of light. That He was basically attached to the sun god who ordered Mithras to go and kill the primeval bull to release life force for the benefit of mankind. Mm, that's interesting symbolism there. Yes. So you've got this powerful deity and then this kind of sub-deity who acts as a, ki a kind of saviour yes. figure for humankind. The rise of Mithras almost exactly parallels the rise of Jesus although his origins could be much more ancient. Some say he was created by the Romans, others that he came from Persia and India. Mithras was, a, was a seen as a saviour god. He was unusual amongst the gods in that you weren't really trying to bribe him in quite the same way that they were trying to bribe some of the other deities um, to make sure that you were, your life on earth was as comfortable as possible. Um, Mithras was rare in that he actually offered you a life after death. So if Mithras predated Jesus and is also a saviour god who offered his followers a life after death, did Christianity steal these ideas? It was a mystery cult. Um, we certainly know that they were having ritual meals. It seems to have been a fairly basic feast, based largely on the chickens, mm. on bread and on wine. 
Bread and wine. Bread and wine, yes. I mean, you know, it's got similarities with early Christianity, the sense of feasting, um, the sense of discipline. You don't have to appease the deity. You work at things for your own mm -hmm. good. Um, there's a deity who is a, a god of light who is sent by a major deity to um, kill his nemesis in mm -hmm. order to redeem and save the world. Yes, the early Christian fathers who wrote a lot were very upset about Mithraism. They thought that Mithraism was parodying Christianity. This so infuriated many early Christians that they felt they had to publicly denounce Mithras and his worshippers. One fourth century Christian writer, Ambrosiaster, tried to demonize their secret rituals. What travesty is it then that they enact in the cave with veiled faces? For they cover their eyes, lest their deeds of shame should revolt them. Some, like birds, flap their wings, imitating the raven's cry. Others roar like lions. Others bind their hands with the entrails of fowls and fling themselves down over pits full of water. What shameful mockeries for men who call themselves wise. Another early church father, Justin Martyr, tried to claim it was Mithras who was copying Jesus. Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, said, This do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body. And having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras. The problem for Christians was that the similarities did not stop there. One tradition claims Mithras even had a virgin birth. Mithras, there are two stories, one that he was born from the living rock and the other that he was born from the cosmic egg. So there is potentially a crossing of ideas and even potentially a merging of ideas between Mithras and early Christianity. Potentially. Uh, there is even a story that uh, Mithras's birth was witnessed by shepherds watching their sheep, but that again is a much later story and you don't know whether at this point Christianity and Mithraism is all getting rather intertwined and it's getting confused. Mithras was a pagan god with a story, a purpose, and elements of ritual very similar to that of Jesus but one whose origins could predate him by thousands of years. But the fact is that Mithraism failed to survive, and it was Christianity that conquered the Roman Empire. But we do know that early Christian fathers were very worried about the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism, especially the charge that Christianity borrowed many of its ideas from this pagan cult. So when paganism was officially outlawed, particular animosity was shown towards Mithraism. Many of its temples were destroyed and others had churches built on top of them. But Mithraism did leave one mark on Christianity. When later church fathers were deciding what anniversary to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, they chose December the 25th, the winter solstice, which also happens to be the birthday of Mithras. I had been told that there was another place, one of the key locations for early Christianity, where the similarities between Jesus and other pagan gods are even more obvious. Egypt. Christianity came very early to Egypt. One tradition claims it arrived just 30 years after Jesus' death. It has also always puzzled scholars why Christianity took hold so easily here. One theory claims it was because of its many parallels with ancient Egyptian religious ideas and rituals. Egyptologist Dr. Boyana Moisov is an expert in the ancient cult of Osiris. Boyana, pleased to meet you. Robin, Hello. can we go inside? Sure. She claims it has uncanny similarities to Christianity and the story of Jesus. 
I met her in Abydos, in Upper Egypt, at the 3,300-year-old temple dedicated to the cult of Osiris. Can you tell me what happened here? Well, once a year there was a festival of Osiris, and the myth of Osiris is the most ancient myth of Egypt. The festival lasted for about a week and reached its culmination on the last three days. And um, on the first of those three days, the earth body of Osiris would be buried. During the second day, vigils in the temple were said uh, for the God's resurrection. And then on the morning of the third day, the statue was brought out into the court through here and all the pilgrims who have gathered from all over Egypt celebrated the resurrection of Osiris. How common was that kind of story? Because for me, the, the story of death and resurrection of a, of a deity emerges with Christianity. So was it common for people to think this way? Well, in the Nile Valley it was. And uh, in the ancient Near East you also have uh, the myths of the sacrificed saviour gods who died for their people and were resurrected, came back uh, to life and would lead uh, all the righteous souls to salvation and eternal life. Well, what would I have seen if I was here 3,000, 4,000 years ago? During the festival, on that night where they buried Osiris, lights were lit and candles were lit all over Egypt to commemorate his burial. So if you imagine the temple, which is full of light, full of incense, people carrying candles and praying for the God's resurrection, the mystery of it, chanting prayers uh, for his resurrection. If you imagine incense, uh, candlelight, uh, vigils, it would have been magical. Many similar rituals are still carried on today by the Egyptian Coptic Church. Which other elements within this passion play, within this myth, have parallels with Christianity? Well, baptism in the Holy River, in the Nile, which were considered to be a sacred river, uh, the sacred Nile water, which was carried into the temple and uh, the statues were anointed with it. Linda, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The eating of corn bread as the body of Osiris, because corn um, came about through the sacrifice of Osiris. So this whole eating of bread and drinking of beer that issued uh, from the risen God uh, is also paralleled by the Eucharist mass in Christianity. So the corn bed and the beer are paralleled today by having the bread and the wine. Exactly. But it's 3,000 years ago. There's a very interesting image in that last room and it consists of the dead Osiris as a mummy placed on a lion bed. His wife Isis hovers over him like a kite, like a bird and at this moment they're engendering the saviour child. So it is uh, the moment that uh, life is being transferred from, from death to life, from father to son. So it's sort of like a miraculous birth. It's a miraculous birth of the saviour child. Wow. These are ideas that we find in the Christian story of Jesus. Did Christianity just steal these ideas from this Egyptian myth? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I would think that Christianity had its own message, a new message, a new philosophy uh, to offer. It simply borrowed these ideas uh, to explain its own message more clearly, to reach a vast amount of people and this is possibly the secret why it spread in Egypt so quickly. So when Paul says I become all things to all people that I can, so that I can win them to Christ, this was an example of that happening where they were using these stories to help explain the Christian story. Yes, I think that's probably right. This is a major revelation because it seems to me you're suggesting that the idea of a saviour God who redeems the world doesn't just begin with modern Europe, doesn't even begin with the ancient Near East. It goes all the way back to the earliest forms of human experience out of Africa. Absolutely, it does. While it may be easy for some Christians to reject any similarities between Jesus and ancient Indian gods thousands of miles away, the Roman god Mithras and the ancient Egyptian cult of Osiris 
are just too close to home to be dismissed so easily. But what about the historical Jesus, the one who lived and died in Rome and Palestine? If you strip away all the Christian dogma around Jesus, the theology created by Paul and his followers, what are you left with? Jesus the Jew. In the next part, we see how Jews have a very different story about Jesus and how some Orthodox Jews even see him as their enemy. Jerusalem, a city holy to Jews, Christians and Muslims. 2,000 years ago, a massive temple dominated the city, the focal point of Jewish worship. And today, its remaining walls are still a sacred place for all Jews. Every week, Hundreds of young Jewish boys celebrate their coming of age here with their bar mitzvahs. Although today Jesus is known as the founder of Christianity, he was of course a Jew. The Bible tells us that on his 12th birthday he came here to Jerusalem, to the great Jewish temple for his bar mitzvah, his ritual coming of age. But for the last 2,000 years, Christianity and Judaism have been at war over Jesus. Why? Because of what some consider to be Christianity's greatest ever lie, that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus on the cross. This simple untruth laid the foundations for centuries of brutal and bloody anti-Semitism, ending with the Nazi-led Holocaust of the Second World War. So it should be of no surprise that many Jews still consider Jesus a symbol of oppression and suffering. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Rabbi Tavia Singer is an Orthodox Jew, born in New York, who hosts a weekly show on Israeli national radio, in which he takes on Christian fundamentalists about their faith, and in particular, 
their belief in Jesus as the Messiah. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. Is there any other figure in history that's come to represent our pain? How many millions of Jews have died because of this? You are a Christian, a devout Christian. You devoted your life to studying this. And in terms of Judaism, for me, I can't be Christian without taking Judaism seriously. When I read the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, I read Jesus in light of the Hebrew Scriptures. For me, as a Christian, Judaism is an integral part of reading and understanding who Jesus was and who Jesus is. If all Christians over the past 2,000 years thought the way you do, there'll be millions of more Jews in the world. This would be a very different kind of world. Most Jews have no issue with Jesus. He just has no place in their lives. But for some Orthodox Jews, like Rabbi Singer, Jesus was responsible for a new religion that tried to undermine and destroy their faith by converting them to Christianity. For them, Jesus is not a savior, but a symbol of oppression. In the ancient Jewish books that make up the Talmud, there is a completely different narrative to Jesus' life. Instead of being the son of God, he's described as the son of Mary, born out of wedlock. Instead of a wise and charismatic teacher who performed miracles, he is seen as a fraudulent magician. Instead of the leader of a new religious movement, he is a dangerous heretic. You know, we have a, a little problem just understanding who really was Jesus. That is that Jesus wrote nothing but a line in the sand in the book of John. See, the problem for the Jewish people or any non-Christian is how do we know what a person uh, who wrote nothing, how do we know what he was really like? So is Jesus a heretic? The Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13 particularly, that a false prophet is to be rejected. As a Christian, I was taught that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. From your perspective, is that a false teaching? Depends what you mean by the Son of God. So for you, Jesus could not be part of the Godhead? Even more so, no one could. There is no Godhead. But there are some Jews who do believe in Jesus. One group, known as Jews for Jesus, has been operating in Israel for the last 12 years. Every week, they hand out leaflets on the streets of Tel Aviv, trying to convince their fellow Israelis that Jesus is the Messiah. Their leader is Dan Sered. This track says here, Yeshua Hetziloti. Yeshua, Jesus saved me. Jews for Jesus claim the Hebrew word commonly used to describe Jesus, Yeshu, is an ancient curse. This name, this acronym that they gave him is actually a curse, and it means may his name and memory be blotted out. But that's not his real name. His real name is Yeshua. Yeshua is a Hebrew word which means salvation. And that's what we are doing. We're trying to tell people that Yeshua, Jesus, is salvation. How do you describe yourself then? Because if you were in Birmingham, England, where I come from, and you said to people that you follow Jesus, they'd say you're Christian. But here... First, you, first, of you, all, first of all, I say that I'm 100% Jewish and 100% Christian. Yeah. Those two things do not contradict. How I define myself, I'm a Jew for Jesus. Jews for Jesus say they are fulfilling Jesus' original mission to persuade other Jews that he is the Messiah. Out of an Israeli population of 6 million, they claim a membership of just 3,000. Under Israeli law, they are forbidden to offer any incentives to entice new converts, and they face huge opposition from Orthodox Jews. Rabbi Singer runs an organization that was set up to combat any attempt to convert Jews to other faiths. They're seeking to destroy our faith. That means that this is a direct assault on, the, on Judaism. You know what they're saying? They're saying that Judaism 
is a, a false, defective faith from which you need to be saved. Rabbi Singer believes Dan Sered and his colleagues are just Christians posing as Jews. So they can infiltrate Jewish communities and make new converts to Jesus. I think there is a lot of ignorance. If you want to believe him, believe in him. If you want to refuse, refuse. You know, we're not forcing you to do anything. You know, the choice is yours. They actually blur the distinctions between Judaism and Christianity in order to lure Jews who would otherwise res resist a straightforward Christian message. I would respond that Jesus, again, gave people freedom. So, if you are a Jewish person and you come to faith in Jesus and you still want to keep the Shabbat, Shabbat, and put a yarmulke on and do all those things, you can do it. Once you believe in Him, the rest of it doesn't matter. It's a knife in our hearts. It's a knife in my heart as a Jew, as a teacher, as a rabbi. The crusaders that came into this city in 1099, what do they have painted on their shields? Crosses. That's exactly right. That image meant destruction. Every Jew in this city, July 15th, herded into a synagogue, doors were locked. John 15, 6, read aloud, those who do not accept will be burnt. They proclaimed, we do this to honor Christ. I was told about another group of Jews whose belief in Jesus has brought them into violent conflict with their Orthodox Jewish neighbors. They don't look very happy. No. They're not very happy, they're quite cross, actually. Was it dangerous to film? Did the person feel... Uh... Uh, the person was myself. <laughs> right, did you feel worried filming it? It's... My hands were a bit shaky, mm -hmm. yeah. Yakim Figueres is an Israeli Christian and pastor of the congregation. His wife, Debbie, is from a Jewish background. They're comparing us to Hitler and the Nazis. Whenever they try to hold a religious meeting, groups of Orthodox Jews often try to disrupt them, sometimes violently. And they've, they've just thrown something at the house? Yeah, they yeah. threw the stone, yeah. So how long has this been going on? How long have you had this kind of hostility? Um, for four years, for four maybe years. more. Yeah. The, the police is almost never there, and, and they, they feel free to come to our house. It's uh, more or less the usual stuff that happens here every week. Jesus was a Jew, and he wanted other Jews to follow him and what he believed about God. Is that what you see yourself doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a Jew and I tell other Jewish people that Jesus is the way as much as I can. I don't force it down their throat and I, uh, you know, I don't force anybody to listen to me. Converting Jews was at the heart of Christian history. Do you see yourself then as being part of that history of needing to convert Jews to make them see that Jesus is the Messiah? The word conversion I feel a bit, a little bit uh, unease with. Paul did not try to make Jews non-Jews. He himself says about himself, I'm a Jew. So we're not trying to convert any Jew. Mm. We're trying to show every human being, uh, to show them the light of Jesus, of the Messiah. And to Jews, even more so as the light of their own Messiah. He will come, the day will come, we read it in the prophets that the Jewish nation will have a personal, intimate encounter with the Messiah. We're just there to tell uh, whoever wants to hear that Jesus is the Messiah that they're waiting for. That Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is their Messiah. While I was talking to Debbie and Yakim, we heard voices outside their Orthodox Jewish neighbors had arrived. So I went to investigate. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. They refused to talk to me. And then the Israeli police turned up. Another one. 
Debbie Figueras also came out and tried to reason with them. Obviously this is quite unnerving. You've got a protest taking place and the police have just arrived. But what it says to me is that Jesus still matters today in Israel. He's still a person of contention. If you're a Jew who follows Jesus, it's not that simple. You may end up having a protest outside your home and antagonizing Jews who still see Jesus and Christianity as a symbol of oppression and suffering. <laughs> Are you worried that things may escalate and that somebody may end up being hurt? Yes, yes. Right now, um, no one, thank God, was physically hurt. But it takes only one uh, uh, more zealous person to take the, the rabbinical say, the, what the rabbis say, and, and take it to his interpretation and, and, and yeah, do something, more, they, something worse. They've told us already, when, when we go into power, yeah. then we will kill you like we killed your Jesus. Yeah, that's something that they were shouting here with loudspeakers in, the, in one of the demonstrations. Which, which is a crazy thing to say, given that uh, the, uh, the basis of anti-Semitism has been that untruth, that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. So they're actually appropriating, taking on that untruth yeah. and using it to um, persecute you. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah, well, absolutely crazy. Yeah, it is absolutely crazy. I, I mean, this could be almost two thousand years ago, where the early Christians are being thrown out of the synagogue, are being harassed by people because they're proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's it's history. Same thing. It's history repeating itself here, but instead it's uh, it's here on camera. Yeah. Yes, and it's uh, uh, Israel, two thousand and seven, a democratic state. In the next part, we investigate the extraordinary claim that Jesus might have actually travelled to India and is even said to be buried there, and how a fifth of the world's population believe Jesus was not a Jew or a Christian, but a Muslim.
5,000 feet up in the foothills of the Himalayas in the hotly disputed territory of Kashmir lies the ancient city of Srinagar. Srinagar is a predominantly Muslim city. The Bible is not the only holy book with the story of Jesus. The Quran mentions him too, 36 times. It gives him many special titles, including Messiah. But in Islam, Jesus is regarded as one of God's prophets, a precursor to Muhammad. The Quran also describes his miraculous birth, how he performed many miracles, and that he was sent to guide the children of Israel. All familiar stuff for Christians, but where it diverges completely from the traditional biblical narrative is its understanding of what happened to Jesus at the end of his life. Srinagar is the starting point for the next part of my investigation, to understand who Muslims believe the real Jesus was. It is also the setting for one of the most extraordinary stories concerning Jesus I have ever come across. All Christians like me are taught from a very early age that Jesus spent his entire life in the Middle East and that he was crucified and died in Jerusalem. But here in Kashmir, there is a totally different story. One that claims that Jesus did not die on the cross, but escaped to India, where he continued his teaching, got married, had a son, and lived to a ripe old age. And even that he was buried here. I have come to meet a man who has spent the last 40 years investigating this ancient tradition. Uh, when you study the Gospels and you come to the information where it is said that uh, Jesus was lost to his parents at the age of 12 and he came back at the age of 28 or 30 mm. to Jerusalem and then he, his ministry was for two years, and after that there was crucifixion. So there is, the first thing is that there is a gap mm. of so many years in the life of Jesus. The second point is that when he was crucified, his legs were not broken, and he was brought down from the cross and put a specially made uh, um, sacrifice. And then next day they say, he is no more there. He is lost to them. So there are two incidents. He is lost as a young man, and he is lost to the people uh, after crucifixion. So I began thinking on it, that he is lost twice, and we have to find him. Professor Fida Husnain is a Sufi part of a mystic tradition within Islam that has a particular reference for Jesus. Over the last 40 years, he has collected copies of many ancient Indian and Tibetan documents that he claims prove Jesus came to India. This is the Tibetan document which is translated from the Chinese. He tells about Jesus um, spreading his message among the lost sheep. His name is the Glass Mirror. He says, Yusu, the teacher and founder of the religion, who was born miraculously, proclaimed himself as the savior of the world. Now, here is a document, Bhuvesha Mahaparan. This is the most important document. It, it says that Jesus comes to Kashmir. He meets the king Shalivahana about uh, 78 AD, and uh, 
he tells him that his name is Ishruputram and Kanyagarbam, born of a virgin and son of God. And, and when was this document discovered? It's an ancient manuscript and its date is 117. 117? Yes. So this is literally a, a second century document yes. which says that Jesus yes. was in Kashmir. Yes. Yes. That's, that's very early. That this is early. He means the king of Kashmir. This is the most important document. Can you tell me what Jesus did when he was here? What, what, what happened? You see, the, the first information what we get, that he meets the king. He meets the king. And he explains to him how he fled away from the land of Malichas there and how he suffered there and how he came to this place. And he stays here. Mm. When he stays here, here, Persian sources and Arabic sources say that here he changed his name from Jesus to Yuzu. In Kashmir he adopted this name, Yuzu. And he continued here till his death and he was buried here. Did, did, he, did he get married when he was here? Did he have children? Uh, what, what, what did he get? Yes, yes. You see, did, according to our two, the two sources which I got, that uh, Mm, Yuzu married Marjan and he had a child named Jehoiakim. So when Christians, and I as a Christian, have been taught to believe that Jesus is crucified, he dies on the cross, and then he's resurrected. So what would you say to Christians who say, this is the tradition of Jesus? You see, I, I, will, I will tell them that Paul, being a Roman, he invented some some dogma and people the roman emperors they propagated that dogma and that dogma influenced europe and they think that do that dogma is correct one of professor husnain's documents even claims that jesus is buried in kashmir so tell me about this one is tariq kabir by mahideen it tells about the story of prophets and saints it says that one Hebrew prophet is buried there and he was a prince who came to Kashmir thousands of years back and he was so pious and he became a prophet. Now there is the decree of this shrine, what we have shrine here. Now the chief justice of Kashmir, he gives a decree, he says that this is a shrine called Yuzas of Pagamar al-Islam. So this suggests that the tomb is the tomb of Jesus. This is where Jesus is buried. Yes, this uh, legal document says he is he's the prophet. Yuzas of is his name. According to Professor Husnain, Jesus is actually buried in a small shrine in the center of Srinagar. It is located in a very religiously sensitive part of the city. Professor Husnain is no longer able to visit the tomb because his beliefs about Jesus contradict mainstream Islamic teaching. And he has received several death threats. Could you tell me who it is who's buried here? Because I've been told that it may be Jesus. This is one of the many Muslim prophets but Jesus is not buried here. Because it is written in our holy book, the Muslim Quran, that Jesus has been taken up to heaven, to Allah. So those people who say it is Jesus are giving incorrect information by saying that he's here. No Muslim in the entire world would say that Jesus is buried here. Many Western scholars also dispute Professor Husnain's claim that this is the tomb of Jesus, and in particular, the dating of his documents. Why was it, do you think, that Jesus came here to Kashmir? Why Kashmir? My point is, general impression in the West is that Jesus belongs to the West. They think Mm, he was a Westerner, maybe white man.
But the but the fact is that Jesus belonged to the East. He was not born in the West. He was born in the East. He belongs to us. We have information about him in Persian, in Urdu, in Kashmiri, in Chinese, in Sanskrit, in Arabic language, in Tibetan also, in many languages. We have a lot of information about him in our books or manuscripts and something. So naturally we have to serve Jesus in the East. Here in Kashmir, we have uncovered an incredible story about the life of Jesus. One that not only fills in the missing years, but also roots him, not just in the Middle East, but also here in India. It's a story which at first glance sounds unbelievable. Jesus in Kashmir, but it's told in so much detail and it has so many documents to support it, some going back to the second century, that it can't be dismissed out of hand. But above all, it tells us something that we in Western Christianity often forget. That the real Jesus is a man of the East and that he belongs as much to Asia as he does to Europe. Professor Husnain's views about Jesus dying and being buried in Kashmir contradict mainstream Islamic thought. So I wanted to find out what the Quran says about Jesus' death. The Egyptian capital, Cairo, is home to the world's oldest Islamic theological university, Al-Azhar. Its rector is Dr. Ahmed El Tayyib. In the Christian Bible, the New Testament, we're told that Jesus was crucified, died, and then was resurrected from the dead. What does the Quran tell us happened to Jesus at the end of his life? We believe, according to the Quran, that Jesus was not crucified, rather that another man was made to look like him. God made a man resemble him so that the Jews thought he was Jesus, and he was crucified in Jesus' place. Jesus was raised by God to heaven at that time. He was not crucified, but someone who looked like him was crucified. For Muslims, Jesus has a very special future role. According to the Hadith, Islamic prophetic traditions, Jesus will return to earth before the Day of Judgment. He will descend at the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus, wearing garments dyed with saffron and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. Every non-believer who smells him will die. He will then search for the Antichrist and will catch up with him at the Gate of Lud and will kill him. One possible location for the Gate of Lud is at the village of the same name in modern Israel. Today, there is a small mosque on the site. So Jesus in Islam is very important because he kills the Antichrist here in Lud. Yes. This is absolutely true. Jesus, who is the son of Mary, may he be blessed by God, is one of the prophets that we believe in, and that is our conviction. Similar to Christian prophecies about the end times, Islam also talks about a day of judgment, for which there will be many signs, one of which will be the return of Jesus. When is the Day of Judgment? Will it come soon? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. No one knows except for God. The Islamic prophecies also predict a series of cataclysmic events, including a great war. On one occasion, the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, The hour will come when violence, bloodshed and anarchy become common. Great cities will be ruined, and it will be as if they had not existed the day before. There will be years of deceit, when a truthful person will be disbelieved, and a liar will be believed. I think that we should find ways in which Jesus helps us to live together better. Do you think that we can agree on 
the teachings of Jesus, that Jesus wants peace, justice, and wants all people to have a good life. We Muslims advise Christians, or rather the people of the West, to pay attention to the teachings of Christ. Otherwise, peace will not exist among those peoples. Today, American culture has taken up the slogan of evangelical Christianity. It's a culture of annihilation, invasion and domination. I don't need to remind you about what is happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is domination over those people. They are spreading injustice, killing people, making women and children homeless. All is done under the name of religion. Do you think Jesus will come back soon? We hope so. We hope so. We hope so. We hope so. We really hope so. We want Jesus to save humanity from injustice. After killing the Antichrist in the run-up to the Day of Judgment, Muslims believe Jesus will then live for another 40 years, have a wife and children, and die a natural death. There is even a tomb awaiting him in Medina, next to the grave of the Prophet Muhammad himself. So, in Judaism, they have no place for Jesus. The Christians say Jesus is the Messiah. You're saying Jesus is a Muslim. Which one is correct? Jesus, the son of Mary, God bless him, was from Israel. But the Jews claimed he was a liar. The Jews also gave him several characteristics that are shameful and are inappropriate for a prophet. For example, they said he was the son of a woman who committed adultery. You Christians believe in him, and we believe in him too. However, Christians see him as divine, but this we think is wrong. We believe that Jesus is a Muslim prophet and that he will come back at the end of time to support Islam and to become its advocate and preach the word of truth. Whether or not I or any Christian likes it, the fact is that although Jesus began life as a Jew and started a new movement that later became Christianity, he is also seen by more than a fifth of the world's population as a Muslim too. In the next part, I investigate how, like me, a famous Indian leader also search for the real Jesus and how he transformed Jesus' teachings into one of the most effective political weapons of the 20th century. Did Gandhi discover the real hidden message of Jesus?
Bethlehem in modern-day Palestine is the traditional setting for the Nativity story, the one Christians celebrate at Christmas. Every year, thousands of pilgrims come here to visit the church and to see the crypt where they believe the story began. For many of these people, it is a profoundly moving moment to kneel and touch the place where Jesus is supposed to have been born 2,000 years ago. But who is the real Jesus? What I have discovered on my journey is that there have been many saviour gods in religions all over the world, very similar to Jesus, and many of them predating Christianity by thousands of years. And I have also learned how Christianity shares many of its core stories and ideas with the Roman mystery cult of Mithras, whose birthday is also the 25th of December, and the ancient Egyptian god, Osiris, who died and was resurrected to save the world. And the 3,000-year-old Hindu god, Krishna, whose birth story is so similar. And the Buddha, whose teachings so closely mirror those of Jesus. And then, I have discovered how two other religions, Islam and Judaism, who share their origins with Christianity, have very different versions of Jesus' life story. The Orthodox Jews, who see him as an illegitimate child, a fraudulent magician and a dangerous heretic. And the Muslims, for whom Jesus is not the Son of God, but a human prophet who will return to earth before Judgment Day to save the world. All of these religions challenge the uniqueness of Jesus' story, the one that I and all Christians have been brought up with. But I still felt that Jesus and his real message remained hidden. While I was in India, I discovered that there was another person who'd been on a very similar journey to me, searching for the real Jesus. He was one of the 20th century's most famous political leaders, a man who confronted and defeated the British Empire, Mahatma Gandhi. Although Gandhi was born a Hindu, he claimed he got great inspiration from Jesus' teachings. Professor Tridip Sirhud is an expert on Gandhi's interest in Jesus. I met him at the Sabamati Ashram in Ahmedabad, Gandhi's former home. He's not interested in the historic Jesus. Uh, he is not really interested whether, that whether there was an immaculate conception or yeah, not, yeah. Or whether the star was there, or whether the wise men went there. But it is the idea of figure of, of Jesus on cross. Yeah. Yeah? And it's that passion of Christ which moves him deeply. Now that's really quite profound because it's almost as if Gandhi is saying, look, move the dogma aside, move aside all the doctrines and get to the essence of the teaching. He says, I regard him as perhaps the greatest teacher that mankind has seen. For Gandhi, the real Jesus was not the one developed in the church over the last 2,000 years, the Son of God, born of a virgin, who was the only path to salvation. Gandhi's Jesus was the original charismatic teacher, the man of action who wanted to change the world. And Gandhi found the core of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. What is the lesson from the sermon that he requires? One, that, that you cannot hate. It's not, it's not an active notion of love. It's not an active notion of compassion. It is a negative notion first, that no matter what it is, no matter how hard my opponent is, now, no matter how tyrannical my opponent is, do I have the capacity not to hate? Two, of course, the idea of non-resistance. At the same time, it is not an inactive non-resistance. It is an active act of non-resistance to the evil. Gandhi took Jesus' teachings and transformed them into one of the most powerful political weapons of the 20th century his philosophy of non-violent resistance. In his long struggle for Indian independence from the British Empire, Gandhi's most famous act of resistance took place when he set out on a march in 1930. The right to manufacture salt was a British monopoly. 
As a symbolic act of defiance, Gandhi planned to break the law by making salt on the coast. But first, he had to march there. This is really the first uh, place where Gandhi halted. Yeah. Uh, they'd walked 13 kilometers that day. Yeah. Uh, by the time they reached here, it was afternoon. And it was a huge reception that the village gave. Uh, I think Gandhi's salt march can be compared to Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem, the culmination of his ministry and his life. Both involved a major confrontation. For Jesus, it was the Romans and the Jewish religious authorities. For Gandhi, it was the British Empire. And for both, it was a highly dangerous strategy. I mean, what do you think was going through the people's minds? Were they apprehensive? Were they optimistic? Did they feel they were going to make it? Gandhi had expected that he would be arrested the night before. Uh, and so the expectation was that British would put him into custody. What happened was completely took him by surprise because when he began walking on 12th March, the entire city walked with him. And, and they had to stop in the city and plead with the people in Ahmedabad to please go back. Yeah. 30,000 people. 30,000 people. people walked oh, with him. It's amazing. Yeah. People probably saw this as the beginning of a revolution. It was the same with Jesus. As he entered Jerusalem, he was also mobbed by a huge crowd. Today, in many of the small villages that Gandhi marched through, local people have built statues to commemorate their hero. Yeah, I just wonder if you could ask the people what Gandhi means to them now. What does he mean to their lives, seeing this bust here? What, what does Gandhi mean to them? Huh? Huh. Father of the nation. Father of the nation. Huh. What does Gandhi mean to you? He gave us independence. With his salt march, Gandhi had started a revolution that later brought an end to British rule in India, just as Jesus caused uproar in Roman Palestine 2,000 years ago. OK, so this where are we now? This is a place called Navagam, and there is a, a, a statue of Gandhi which tells us that he spent the second night yep. uh, uh, in Navagam, and the only place which could have housed him was the village school. Yep. There's a cross, there's the sign of the Om, and there is the crescent moon, mm. which says, my life is my message. And this is really quite profound because it's yes. a, it, it tells us a great deal about Gandhi, bringing together Christianity yeah. with Hinduism, with Islam, with Islam, and saying that what really matters is how you embody it, how you actually practice these ideas. As we were talking, an elderly man walked up. It turned out that he was here when Gandhi arrived on his march in 1930. Given that I'm making a program about Jesus, mm. does he feel that Mahatma Gandhi was, was like Jesus? Because mm. I see some comparisons in terms of their teachings. Mm. Does he feel that Gandhi was for him mm. like, a, like a messiah, a mm. saviour figure? Mm. He says he was, a, he yeah. was God like. He says, you know, uh, the, the, the prophet or Krishna or Ram are only stories for me. Yeah? But here is this man who I have seen, I, who I have lived with, and I have seen him transform all of us. What was the most important thing mm. he learned from Gandhi? What mm. meant the most to him 70 years on? Mm. Mm. It is just one word self-reliant, do your own work yourself. He says, I still wash my clothes, do everything that, you know, all the bodily work that I need to do, I do it myself and I don't rely upon people. And he said, I, I hope to be able to do that you know, till, till, till the very last. That's a really powerful message mm. because when many people think of the teachings of Jesus, and I'm searching for the real Jesus, they think about the spiritual things. Mm. Jesus as the Son of God, or the dogma, the Trinity, mm. or ideas about mm. spirituality, which are very kind of otherworldly. Mm. But here, mm. what we find mm. in the teachings, and what he said about the way he remembers most about Gandhi, and where it connects with the message of Jesus, is in the practical. Yes. The fact that to have faith, yeah. Yeah. to and be... So to be a person of faith yeah. is, to, is to live. Yeah, it, live, live that faith, live that idealism. And that's why he could say, my life is my message. Mm. Yeah? And Thank, you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Happy Diwali. 
The Salt March was an absolutely pivotal moment in Gandhi's and India's struggle against the British, and some commentators have argued that it was the beginning of the end of the British Empire. Since then, Gandhi's brilliant use of non-violence has been emulated by hundreds of resistance movements around the world. It was used by Martin Luther King in his struggle for civil rights in America, by Nelson Mandela in his fight against apartheid in South Africa, and by Lech Walesa's solidarity movement in Poland. All of these movements of oppressed and marginalized people for justice and human rights can trace their origins back to Gandhi and his inspiration, his teacher, the author of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself. Just outside the village of Nag Hammadi in Egypt is a complex of caves carved out of a massive cliff. In December 1945, there was an extraordinary archaeological discovery here. A local farmer was searching for some fertilizer when he uncovered an ancient clay jar. When he broke it open, he found 13 manuscripts containing 52 religious and philosophical texts. It has been described as one of the greatest discoveries in Christian history. The texts that were uncovered revealed a version of Jesus' story that had been hidden away for over 1,600 years. The Christianity we have today is largely based on the work of one man, Paul. For Paul, Jesus was a heavenly being sent to earth to save the world from sin. Over the last 2,000 years, Christianity has built a huge edifice to affirm those basic ideas. A theology around Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin who died and was resurrected. It is Paul's version of Christianity that dominates the world today. What was discovered here in this cave over 60 years ago revolutionized scholars' understanding of early Christianity. And in particular, I believe it revealed the core elements of Jesus' story. Today, most of the manuscripts are locked away in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. I have been granted special permission to view one of the 1,600-year-old texts, an ancient gospel that paints a very different picture of Jesus, the Gospel of Thomas. Yes, the Gospel of Thomas. It is the important one here in this collection. So this is a fragment from the Gospel of Thomas? Yes. Wow, wow, yes. this is absolutely amazing because this is very, very old. The original text is thought to have been written at the same time as part of the New Testament. And arguably, this is a more important find in church history than even the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it's probably the most important find. Yes, uh, yes. It, is, yes. it is the only gospel who speaks about the uh, saying of Jesus. The first line of the Gospel of Thomas reads, these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke. Unlike the Gospels that made it into the New Testament, there are no stories about Jesus' birth, life or death, just his teachings. Do you mind if I hold it? No, sure, oh, sure. No, you can. Wow, this <laughs> yes. is... Oh, no, no, I'll keep it, I'll keep it in the case because yes. this is a very, very precious and priceless piece of Christian church history because there's a very different image of Jesus presented here through the sayings of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. The trouble for many Christians is that this gospel has no mention of the virgin birth, no mention of Jesus as the Son of God, and no mention of the resurrection. And for many Christians today, this is heresy. One of the museum's curators was a Coptic Christian, so I asked her how she felt about the Gospel of Thomas. I am Christian and I, this uh, idea is totally different about Christianity. Do you think it's heresy? Yes, I think so. But the Jesus here isn't the Jesus you believe in? No, no. It isn't? No, it isn't. Not at all? Not at all. Do you feel that this is actually a dangerous thing 
to have here because it isn't part of the traditional understanding of Jesus. Yes, you are right. What is clear from this discovery is that some of the earliest Christians had a very different view of Jesus. A Jesus without the Christian dogma that Paul and his followers revealed later. And for me, that's the real hidden Jesus. I don't care if Paul borrowed ideas from other pagan gods, or whether Jesus was influenced by the Buddhists, or even whether he is buried in Kashmir. My search has told me that if you want to find the real Jesus, it is his teachings that are important, and in particular, how they can be put into action, just as Gandhi realized 75 years ago. 20 miles south of Bethlehem, in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, I am now on my way to meet up with a group of Palestinian olive farmers. With them are some foreign helpers. Every autumn, a desperate struggle is played out on the hills around Bethlehem between Palestinian farmers who want to harvest their olives and Israeli settlers who try to prevent them. You can see the rooftops there are part of the settlement. It is a microcosm of the decades-long Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Many of the olive trees are on Palestinian land, right next to the Israeli settlements, and the settlers are worried about their security. Religious groups try to help the farmers negotiate access to their land. So it's a Christian organisation? It is. So why did you get involved in this? What's the motivation? Eileen Hansen is a Christian volunteer. We believe that the Gospel is, is about uh, standing in solidarity with people, particularly the poor, those who are facing violence. So we've taken on, as peacemakers, uh, the Gospel call to be peacemakers and to do that actively. So when Jesus speaks of people who follow Jesus being those who make peace, you see that as being an integral part of your faith? Yes, and that it's an active, it requires an active participation in being a peacemaker. Right. To have faith in Jesus is to take risks, even if that means risking your own life. We come to zones of conflict in particular yeah. to be peacemakers, because mm. it's one thing to be a peacemaker where there's no risk involved, yeah. but armies are sent to zones of conflict and put mm. their lives in danger mm. in order to make war. And we feel that the same call, the same risks must be um, made by peacemakers if we really are serious about wanting peace. But there are not just Christians here. Leading the negotiations with the Israeli soldiers guarding the settlement is a Jewish rabbi. The very first verses of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we learn that all human beings are created but Sedem Elohim, in God's image. It doesn't just say uh, Jews or non-Jews, or the rich or the poor, and it makes a point of saying both men and women. Uh, and so, starting from that basic idea that we are all created in God's image, uh, we believe that we have a religious obligation to honor that image of God in every human being, and, and that means honoring people's human rights. The incredible thing here is that we have a Jewish rabbi, helped by a Christian peacemaker team, negotiating on behalf of some Muslim farmers. For me, this is just what the real Jesus would have done. We believe that everybody is created in God's image. The settlers are created in God's image. Uh, the Palestinians are created in God's image. Even the soldier with the gun? The soldier with the gun is created in God's image. And we have to have that in front of us at all times. Well, it looks like the uh, commander is coming yes. back. Let's so see we'll what find happens. out what's going to happen. Despite the rabbi's best efforts, the army is refusing to let the farmers onto their land. This is an absolutely extraordinary situation. You've got these Palestinians who want to do nothing more than do a day's work, harvest their land. And in order to do that, they've got to get permission from the Israeli army. And they've got to go through this complex negotiation just to be able to do a day's work. Never seen anything like this. After another hour of negotiation, the Israeli soldiers finally gave in and allowed the Palestinian farmers 
to go onto their own land. To understand the real Jesus, you have to strip away the doctrine, push aside the dogma and go to his teachings. And it's a message that we can all buy into, Christians, Jews, Muslims, all faiths. It's a simple message of truth, justice and human rights for all. And I think if Jesus was around today, this is what he'd be doing. Having now looked outside the Christian tradition, I believe the real Jesus, the one I call the Son of God and my personal saviour, was a revolutionary teacher, an oppressed Jew who challenged the hierarchy of Judaism and the tyranny of the Roman Empire. And for this reason, Jesus was executed like any political enemy. What he left us with was a universally powerful message about what it means to serve your God, to oppose injustice and oppression wherever it's found. It doesn't matter whether anything in Christianity is borrowed from other religions, and it doesn't matter whether you believe in the virgin birth, resurrection, or even the Christmas nativity. What really matters is Jesus' message, a message that all these religions share, a message that if we follow, we can change the world for the better.